Are but you serious? The facade is as important as the jeté. I can do that. And if you start thinking too far in advance, then you can't be present for this moment. Thank it's you. Been, I was drafted, I was bamboozled, and I'm so very happy about it. Welcome to the Spotlight Academy with me, your host, Jerry Gale. Today, we're going to focus on the category of dance with a very special guest. I have been compiling questions from, from teachers and students throughout the year, so we're going to take like a deep dive into some of those as well. So let's meet our guest. Jamal Story is a Spotlight alum, and he started his training in Los Angeles with Lula Washington Dance Theater, and then after college, he went on to a professional career with Complexions Contemporary Ballet Company, one of my favorites. He then turned to commercial dance when he was touring with Madonna, and then he did Cher show and then well he went on to Broadway and he starred in the color purple and then went on to Motown the musical if you haven't seen it it's fabulous but wait there's more because he has his own production company and he's a choreographer he teaches he consults he like just recently published his own book what more can I say Jamal thank you so much for joining us thank you for having me and you know I've decided you're hired I should oh, I'm gonna you. take you everywhere and please introduce me please. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was no. that was amazing. When I read about you, and this is like one of the things I, I absolutely love is how diverse your career has been. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, I want to get like right into this because so yeah. often, especially dancers, maybe more with ballet dancers than contemporary, we think we're just going to start with one style. It's going to be yeah. contemporary or jazz or modern or ballet, whatever it is. And maybe we'll sprinkle in a, a, a class here in hip hop or something else. Mm -hmm. You know, when I look at your career and everything you've done, I really want to talk about how important diversity of your dance styles is especially for you because you've been a dancer but you've also been on the other side as a choreographer and sure. producer so how important is this it's so important i find that i was fortunate to get a solid base in 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 some some strong techniques i've got a lot of uh, good old-fashioned modern dance i got horton i got Graham, I got Graham especially, and ballet in undergrad. And those were strong foundations to get me the discipline in my body that I needed to be able to handle a lot of different stuff. Right. But fortunately, because I grew up in LA, I had access to hip hop. I had access to certain kinds of jazz that were popular at that time in the commercial dance industry. What it clarified for me is this idea that it wasn't going to be enough at that time even, to just do one thing, to be just proficient in one thing. I still grew up in a time in dance where you could, you could be what we used to call specialists. You know, right. like, and, <laughs> I mean, obviously if you're a principal ballet dancer, you're a specialist. If you're in a modern dance company like Graham, and that's what you do, you're a specialist and you stay there. And then of course there are hip hop dancers. There are people, there were crumpers that were, that was what they did at the time. And they were extraordinary at it and very practiced and very invested in the craft after that. But I think that period is gone, meaning the period where you can actually sustain a dance career easily on just one specialty, that period is over, I think, for dance. And part of that is so you think you can dance. Part of that is this yeah. is this idea that you have a show that challenges dancers to jump around the diversity of dance styles and movements. I right? forgot and to dance. mention you're an aerialist too. Yes, and I'm an aerialist too, yes. And that was another skill I picked up. And you know, that was, and so that's how I kind of did the career. I went, okay, what else can I grab? I'm gonna grab that. Okay, well, I have some gymnastics in my background. Let me see how I can incorporate that. Oh, now there's an, an opportunity to do aerial work on share. I was kind of drafted for it, I'll say. I, I have to own that I didn't pursue. <laughs> I have a lot of young dancers that come to me and I'm always impressed and excited about the way that they are pursuing aerial information to add to their toolboxes. But with me, it was one of those things where I had no intentions of, of, of going up into the air. I was drafted, I was bamboozled, and I'm so very happy about it. <laughs> <laughs> very happy about it. Nowadays, the industry has changed so much that there's no side of it. The commercial side of it might want you to salsa, might want you to merengue, might want you to do some serious partnering. And then in the next number, 
is hip hop. Now, similarly, in concert dance, choreographers outside of the realm of concert dance are being brought into ballet companies to create master works. And so now it's not enough just to have a solid ballet base. You also need to be able to access these other ways of moving, moving inside of your body. That only comes with kind of grabbing everything that you can. For me, I was fortunate enough to have a career that included a trajectory of diversity of dance. Now, I think that that's sort of a mandate to a successful career. And that's what I tell young dancers a lot. I did an interview with Tyler Pack and she mm -hmm. talked about, and, it's, and you, you'll you understand this just being in, in complexions because sure. that is a really diverse company. She talks about the fact of a choreographer will come into company class and they'll watch or they'll ask, you know, well, who here can do, I know you can do ballet, but who can do hip hop? Who can do, you right. know, all the things that you said. And it's like, you always want to be the person that says, I can. Yeah. I can do that, yeah. right? Absolutely, absolutely, because, yeah. Because yeah. you're you know not going to have longevity in a career if you don't. Right, right, right. And there's such constant evolution in dance, some of it absolutely for the better. So I certainly don't want to suggest that it's a bad thing, but that evolution creates what you're describing, that phenomenon that Tyler talks about, that now the asks are different, sometimes extraordinary. I was with Donald Byrd, the group in New York as well, and he is now the artistic director of Spectrum, dance theater in Seattle. And one of the things that he does as a choreographer is he creates these evening linked works that are very, very much social commentary on what's going on in the world. Crystal Pite is another one who does something similar, it requires oftentimes that you get further into the world of theater. So now it's, can you tap? Because that's gonna help tell the story. What other vocabulary, movement vocabulary can we pull from that is going to help us move the thesis statement of this ballet forward? and then affect more hearts. It's now, hey, learn it all. Get it all. Please get yeah. it all. There's a few colleges that have really strong dance departments. And mm -hmm. I think that there used to be this feeling that you had to go into a commercial career immediately after graduating from high school. If you weren't young, forget about it. Like if you started to have a dance career at 24, 25, it's over. So you went to college and you studied dance and you, you've had this amazing career. So how do you feel about starting your career after college or, you know, what are your thoughts about that for dancers? I, you know, it's a good question and it's one that I've gotten a lot uh, over the past few years. First of all, we're now out of the period where there's a stigma attached to not going to college. The good news is that, you know, no one's gonna, gonna frown on you if you choose something else that's more germane to your career path. I think a lot of whether you should pursue college or jump right into your career has to do with what aspect or what portion of the dance landscape you want to dive into first, coupled with how much discipline you have in your body. My thought is if you need a lot more formalized training to make your instrument more fine-tuned, to sort of put those pieces together and then get the nuances really, really, really tight, then perhaps, perhaps an undergraduate uh, education is good in that way. If you are wanting to sort of start in a specialty, start somewhere, you know, like my base is going to be this, and then I'm going to add to the toolbox, as I said earlier, with these other things, then perhaps then college is a great, a great idea. If you are starting out, if you've had years and years and years of dance training and you have a lot of discipline and talent in your body and you have a lot of, of understanding and wherewithal, and you're also connected to the industry that you want to pursue, meaning you have some inroads. If it's a concert dance company, you've taken the workshops, you've done the summer intensive there a number of times, you've been hanging out with the company members or sort of learning the culture, the company culture of, of where you wanna be, then it may not be necessary at all for you to pursue a degree first. The other side of it is, and this is, this is sort of part of another discussion, so I, I won't go too far right, right this minute, but part of it is also, you want to think in terms of your backup plan. Yeah. Meaning what is your what is going to be your waiting tables gig now? And the waiting tables gig doesn't necessarily have to be waiting tables or even being a barista. Those are all wonderful things to do, but perhaps that's not what you want to do. Perhaps there is another angle that will work. My second degree is in TV radio communications with an emphasis in journalism. Oh. I came out <laughs> find out something new, right? So I came out with that degree 
because I thought, what if dance doesn't work out? Now, this is me in the 90s. You're so, so smart. I had all of the, the worries. I was afraid. I won Spotlight and then was still afraid. What if it doesn't work out? You know, so I, I, I won Spotlight and then went right to college and then said, I'm going to get this other degree just in case. And so, so maybe that's what it is. You're going because you want to get the fine tooth uh, combed training. You want to get all the kinks out and you want to get a degree in finance or and you want to get something in marketing or and you want to do an internship somewhere so that in the time like this, where chips are really down, you have another avenue. That might be the reason that you're going to school. That might be a reason to consider. Wait, that's an amazing thing. So you have a second degree. Like, have you found that that has come in handy? Like, have you used that aspects of that degree? And like, talk to, what about that? The journalism piece of it has contributed so much to the writing. When I blog, when I when I write a book on, even though it's about dance, uh, the first one, 1234, is not about dance. And they're both pieces of fiction, by the way. But the idea is that if you do something, it makes it easier to do something that is off brand. And branding, of course, nowadays is very important. It was important before it's, you know. Everything. And it can be such a juggernaut in your, yeah. in, in your life. But the branding piece of it is that I'm a dancer that it where for, for whom it worked out. I remember uh, when I wrote 1234, a professor called me. I was in, in rehearsal to do a Nutcracker. I was doing Arabian and maybe Snow King. And I remember I was getting, <laughs> I was putting on the dance belt and everything to go into to rehearsal. I had some time to spare and I get this call from a professor who is the father of a close friend of mine who said, Jamal, are you available at such and such a time in a, in a few weeks? The students want to hear from you. And I went, what are you, what are you talking about? And he says, well, the students, my students in the English class, I've taught, I'm teaching your book and they have a lot of questions about sort of the organization of it. And so I'm thinking you should come in, pay for you to come in and just, and I'm thinking I'm just gonna come in for 10 minutes or something at some point and have this conversation in LA. And then he sends an email, he says, so I'm thinking five minutes to discuss yourself and then 10 minutes to discuss sort of how you came up with the idea for the book. And then 45 minutes on figurative language and narrative form and structure and voicing. And I went, oh, I'm doing a lecture is what, oh, okay. Followed by a Q&A. Oh, so I am the class that day. Got it. At the end of the class, someone asked, someone picked up the book and said, so it says here, you know, dance and share and Madonna and some other things. So why haven't you written about that? I don't understand why you're, I mean, why, I don't, I don't understand. Because, and that's when it became clear from a branding standpoint that this student was having this sort of cognitive dissonance about the man standing in front of him who was lecturing about a book and giving an English lecture, but I am a professional dancer with this resume. So why don't those things go together? And that's when I realized, ah, because this lecture is off brand completely. It has nothing to do with my career. That's why when I wrote the second book, even though it's a piece of fiction and it still, you know, sort of celebrates my love for journalism and English and all that stuff, it is about da a dance company so that I could bring those two things together. And that's the Im important piece of it. Trying to figure out how all of those things are going to correlate for you in your life and times as you pursue your dance career, those are the questions that you want to ask yourself first that will inform whether or not you go straight to college or go straight into the dance career. I think it's important to cultivate when you're young, in high school, different interests outside of dance because you never know where those things will intersect at some point in your career. Have a bigger world, you know, really kind of elongate your world. Yes. you know, in every yes. way. Oh yeah, and understanding too that a college may not be the backup. Meaning, so exactly. I- Exactly. Right, so I'm an insurance broker, so I can sell you a life insurance policy if you, if you live in the state of New York at this yeah. point. Are but, you serious? So, no, you're yeah. not. No, no, I am. I'm, I'm actually a licensed- Stop <laughs> it! <laughs> that, that, and I'm gonna be totally frank, that is a relatively recent thing. Right? It came out of what is going to be the thing that helps me to transition into whatever the next thing is. Meaning I'm not trying to wait until I get injured and then you know drop out of dance and then try to figure it out. I'm going, how can I, what other tool or what other thing can I grab to bring into sort of my dance advocacy? Because so I sit on the board of SAG-AFTRA in New York and I'm a chair of the National Dance Committee for, for the union. And I partner with several people on leadership for Dancers Alliance in New York. I do all of this dance advocacy work and I said, so what is it that I can do professionally that will sort of complement 
what it is I do in dance advocacy and still be sustainable. And I thought, oh, insurance, because of course, part of the issue is that the insurance industry is not really concerned with people like us who work the way that we do. Good luck trying to sell one of us a life insurance policy. We don't make enough money oftentimes to pay the phone bill, the T-Mobile bill. So what are you talking about? But the education that I have with it teaches me that there are ways to approach us about longevity and longer term moments and investment that way so that we can actually benefit from an insurance policy or an annuity or what have you. And that there are ways to actually not only start to get that, but also to get people who are naysayers about your career invested in that part, like parents, <laughs> like uncles and aunts. So my thought is insurance would be a way of sort of staying inside of the brand of who is Jamal Story? He is a dancer, choreographer, aerialist, and dance advocate. I want to add that to your resume, insurance broker. Okay. <laughs> no, that is like it. the best. Okay, so let's go on to something else. You've graduated, you're in a company. Now maybe there are offers coming your way, or maybe even you've graduated high school and you're sure. cute and you want to like be in commercial dance and stay in LA and the dance group here. Do you need an agent? Do you have to get an agent? How do you get an agent? Like, what is that about? Okay, if you go to LA, you definitely want to get an agent. You want to get, get the representation that you need, mainly just to get to the auditions. Also too, agents are going to be your bad guy. One of the things I always uh, say about agency is that when, when you have someone representing you that way, all you have to do is show up and be your lovely, mercurial, fun, loving, energetic self in the studio. You have someone else saying, no, no, not enough, not okay absolutely not where's my money someone else is going to do that part for you so that you can just be lovely you getting can be an the agent artist in, right right getting an la getting an agent in any anywhere but uh, certainly la can be challenging in a lot of ways but the main idea is understanding the entire time that it is a business that if you go to an agency call you look them up you can go to their website to msa or any of those those agents block and they will show you when they're having auditions you show up to the audition There'll be a lot of people there, it's fine. There are a whole lot of factors that go into whether or not you get picked up by an agent at that time. One of them might be the fact that, they, that as talented as you are and as amazing as you are, there are seven of you at the agency already. They represent six other people who look like you, who have the same attributes, who have the same sort of specialties. It does a disservice to the agent to now bring in someone else who is going to compete with the collection of views that I have here in terms of type. And you know, we are in an industry that is very superficial at first, hopefully not all the time and not at, not at second, but at first, you know, it's what do you look like? Can you sell the product? Can you sell the thing? Can you be in the commercial? Do you have the skills? What have you? That's one aspect of it. The other aspect of it is uh, certainly going to Los Angeles is about meeting and networking. It's about meeting the people. It's about sort of figuring out what choreographers you like or would like to work with and taking class and, you know, sort of making yourself known there in, in that way and not known as a celebrity, just present, just I'm here, I'm invested, and then doing that work, that is always a part of it. The, the other piece of it is understanding the difference between agency and management. Right. You know, I get that question a lot too. Right. Agents typically take a, a smaller percentage or commission from the work that you do. Managers usually take more because there is a smaller, they have a smaller client base and they are thus able to be more invested in all aspects of the talent that they are representing. These are basically scaffold ideas on this stuff. I mean, there are obviously exceptions and remixes of what I'm talking about, but right. it's important to have those distinctions and really get firmly invested in the business of your dancing, the business aspect of your craft. The idea that now, especially with so many people being represented by the big agents in Los Angeles, now every dancer has to do a little bit more to get jobs and sometimes to seek them out and all of that stuff. Career building is something that has to be a combo platter. It cannot be exclusively the domain of the agent anymore. Right. It's unrealistic, it would be ideal but it, it just doesn't happen that way oftentimes. I think it's so important to go take classes from choreographers that you're interested in working with so you learn their style so that when you get 
into an audition situation, it won't be that difficult for you to catch on, to yeah. learn the steps quickly sure. because choreographers want to know that you can pick up stuff yes. fast. Right. Right, which goes back to that idea of having solid discipline in your yes. body. I like to use that as an expression because technique becomes so loaded, you right. know, when describing the abilities of dancers in a very broad space, like all of dance. <laughs> technique becomes a loaded word, but discipline, physical discipline and physical ability to handle the variety that might come at you is what we're talking about, even in, to your point, even in this context, is learning people's styles, being able to, to handle all of that stuff, and then being able to look at what the person in the front of the room is doing and then get as close to that truth as you possibly can. Sometimes there are people in Los Angeles who did not go to college, they went straight to Los Angeles, but the investment in the craft in that way is so concentrated and so complete that they're able to do what you said in space. We could go on and on and on, but I do oh, have yeah, one right. last question for you. And to me, this is the most important. If we have little Jamal like with you right now, right. You know, little 15, 14, 16 year old Jamal right now next to you, what advice would you as a professional, as a grown man give to little Jamal like well, not little, but young, younger Jamal, mm -hmm. to help this to help this person move forward in their life. Like, what advice would you give them? My biggest piece of advice for my younger self <laughs> would probably be to take everything one step at a time and be thoroughly present for the execution of that step. When I got to Donald Byrd, the group, I, I got to learn that lesson. Um, Donald Byrd, prolific choreographer, Tony Award nominee, you know. Look him up. Donald Byrd, please look up Donald Byrd. Often confused with the musician by the same name who passed yeah. not too terribly long ago. When I was dancing with a company, the one of the things that is typical of, of most of the work is that it's a lot of steps. It's a lot of steps and brilliant work, a lot of steps and so much physical information in a ballet, even just one ballet, that you stand to get overwhelmed right away. And what I realized is I had a good rehearsal director to, to help me get to the concept one step at a time. If you start thinking too far in advance, then you can't be present for this moment. And then if you can't be present for this moment, then then you're not gonna be able to get to the next step. The glissade is as important as the jeté. Thank you. you. Yeah. If you're not there for the glissade, you can't get up in the air. Thank you. And the pot de berets and the step. I mean, this is yes. small. It's the in-between. The little things. It's the little things. You've got to, and those, and they matter. What I realized is if I could just do that, if I could just stay in each step of the choreography and then not think too far ahead while I'm in the moment, before, in your preparation, absolutely. You plan it, you plan and you think, and you go, okay, what, what do I need? But in the moment that you're doing it, you wanna be right where you are fully so that you can get the most out of that experience. And it's going to add to all of the information that you have moving forward in, in your life and times. And then you can find the applications for everything. It helps to not get overwhelmed. You know, I don't know what happens with professionals, not just in dance, but in anything. If you wake up in the morning and you go, this is all that I have to do today. And then you go all the way to 10 o'clock or 11 and you think about all those things before you've even had a cup of coffee, you're not gonna do it. You're just gonna go, screw it. I'm getting back in bed. There's just no way. You're gonna like lose your mind, right? So the way to not lose your mind is to have the cup of tea or have a cup of coffee, be in that moment and then one step at a time because you've already put it in your calendar, you've already written it down, you, you already know the work that you need to do. That's what I would have told young Jamal and I think it would have helped me to also gather a lot more information so that in this moment, in this COVID moment even, I have more of a sense of, oh, well, this is what I'm doing right now or this is what I'm gonna do right now or this is because I will have, I will have unknowingly canvassed so many different experiences that people have shared up until the point that I figured it out, which was in my early 20s. <laughs> so, you know, I'm wow. just years in there between maybe 16 and I don't know, 20, 25, 24, you know. I'm much I... older than you and I haven't figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> the things ahead, that on. I have gotten from talking to you are discipline mm -hmm. and be present. Yes. Be in the moment. Be in the moment, yes. Yes, if people watching this are taking even just that 
then, oh my gosh, I feel like I've done my job. Being present sort of helps you to build. Being present helps you to really, really get the most, even if it's a lesson that hurts, it helps you to get the most out of whatever that is. I also want to add centering the holistic approach to, to your life. Look at look at the whole thing. That's you good. know, the dancing, and that will help you to sort of make business decisions and and think, you know, in terms of what do I want? I want to buy a house. I want to do these things. I also want my dance career. You can want all the things. Start to look at it from a ten thousand foot view, perhaps. If those three things, if you can get those three things out of this, then. <laughs> <laughs> doing something right here oh, yes jamal i just want to thank you so much this has been an incredible conversation with you and i love you i'm so glad that you're part of the spotlight family and the music center family and i'm hoping that you know we open up theaters open up and you're here in los angeles and we can all come and watch you perform i would love that i would love that spotlight it has meant so much to me over the years and some of the other alums matthew rushing misty copeland i know them and every now and then talked about it in individual conversations and they've said the same thing but it has meant so much to me in terms of sort of helping to shape me even the process of getting to spotlight and working on the solo and all of that stuff has been amazing so i'm happy to give back it does my heart good it really does so thank you for having me. Thank you so much. And all of you, thank you for joining us and we will see you next time. Want to see more videos like this? Yeah, of course you do. Please like and subscribe to our YouTube channel right here and visit us at the Music Center offstage at our website, musiccenter.org. Until next time. <laughs>